In this video, I start my quest to complete a total synthesis of aspirin. As explained in my introduction video for this project, my goal is to start from natural resources and end with a form you can buy over the counter at any modern pharmacy. Here's the process graph, but first I need to make a little bit of room. Alright, okay, okay, just, just a bit more, and stop. Perfect. Okay, one of the first things I'll need to make is sulfuric acid, and that's what this segment of the series will be focusing on, starting with this video. Sulfuric acid is one of the strongest acids industrially used, and that makes it extremely useful for chemically powering many reactions in chemical manufacturing, some of which I'll need to do later on in the series. It's therefore good if I can get it as soon as possible. To start this, I want to acquire a source of elemental sulfur or sulfate salt, which are two of the most abundant materials in which sulfur can be found in nature. It's so common that sulfur is actually the 15th most common element on Earth. So-called native sulfur has been collected in places with high volcanic activity for millennia, but because it's a good oxidizer like oxygen, it's mostly found in the form of sulfides and sulfate salts bound up with other materials. Its reactivity has made it integrate into the biochemistry of life on Earth over millions of years of evolution, and that's why today sulfur and its compounds are actually regarded as a kind of contaminant from the industrial extraction of crude oil, ores of minerals, and metals like iron. The ubiquity of sulfur on Earth makes it a nuisance, and the removal of sulfur in these industries I just mentioned is big business. In some places like the oil sands of Alberta, Canada, companies literally pile up mountains of pure sulfur as they try to figure out what to do with it. As it happens, one of the main uses of the separated sulfur from mining is for the production of sulfuric acid, just like I'm trying to do. Because the acid is so useful, the creation of sulfuric acid from the sulfur contaminant is a happy accident, which turns a waste product into one of the most important feedstocks of modern industry. Indeed, about 85% of all sulfur extracted from the ore globally is used in the production of sulfuric acid. A statement made in the 2012 article on sulfuric acid by Müller in the most recent edition of Ullman's Encyclopedia of Industrial Chemistry is worth reading in full. Of all the heavy industrial chemicals, sulfuric acid is perhaps the most fundamentally important in that it has a number of large-scale uses not only within the chemical industry, but in other industries as well. By far the most important user is the phosphate fertilizer industry. Other important applications of sulfuric acid are found in petroleum refining, pigment production, steel pickling, non-ferrous metals extraction, and the manufacture of explosives, detergents, plastics, and man-made fibers. Many specialty areas of the chemical industry also use varying amounts of sulfuric acid, including the production of dyes, pharmaceuticals, and fluorine chemicals. The consumption of sulfuric acid has, many times, been cited as an indicator of the general state of a nation's economy. Having sulfuric acid in many ways is like having power. If I want it, a good place to start might be to look at the people who have been making it for centuries. I'll then work backwards, figuring out what I need to get based on the methods I can actually carry out. Ullman's Encyclopedia, mentioned earlier, is a great resource for chemical engineering information and history. According to the same article by Müller, the main industrial method for the production of sulfuric acid as of 2012 is the contact process. Developed between 1831 and the 1930s, the contact process involves the passing of sulfur dioxide over a solid catalyst to oxidize it to sulfur trioxide, and then passing the sulfur trioxide through water to form the sulfuric acid. The source of the starting sulfur dioxide today comes primarily from the roasting of metal ores like pyrite or fossil fuels like coal and oils contaminated with sulfur. The critical part, the catalyst, undertook different forms over the century of development of the contact process. First, a platinum catalyst developed by Phillips in 1831, and then the vanadium pentoxide catalyst developed by BASF in 1913, which are still used today. High pressures accompany this transformation, often exceeding 5 bar. The catalyst, the pressure... This makes the contact process inaccessible to me with the equipment I have. The title for this series is Making Aspirin from Scratch in 65 Plus Easy Steps for a Reason. I need something gentler. I also don't have a source of vanadium or platinum for the catalyst lying around anywhere I live. Indeed, although vanadium occurs about as often as zinc in the Earth's crust, 
Native vanadium just lying in exposed cliff sides is rather rare, so this just wasn't going to work. Luckily, through my research, I found a method of making sulfuric acid through electrolysis. As theorized by Australian YouTube creator Scrap Science in a 2018 video, two-chamber electrolysis of a solution of sulfate salts in water at atmospheric pressure should yield dilute sulfuric acid after a few days using a simple terracotta pot as a membrane. So, if I can find a source of calcium or magnesium sulfate salt and make some distilled water, I can use electrolysis to make sulfuric acid. On the other hand, if I find a source of sulfide, or more likely, elemental sulfur, I'll need to follow the pathway where I'll need to do a whole lot of other stuff first before I can get the sulfuric acid. For example, if I find a sulfur ore like pyrite, I would need to use a Sicilian calcarone process where I pile up the ore over a trench and set up a fire underneath it. Or use a chamber process where I put the ore into a container and build a fire around it. Such a process had been demonstrated by YouTube creator Pumpkin Seed Valley in a 2018 video, but it was a whole lot less gentle and less controlled than electrolysis. Basically, making industrial chemicals with almost nothing is like being brought back to what people were doing in the 1800s. The frash process, which came after the Sicilian calcarone methods, but before the industrial processing of ores gave us more sulfur than we know what to do with, was developed by Hermann Frosch between 1894 and 1903, and involves drilling a well a few hundred meters deep into a sulfur deposit, pumping boiling water into the well to melt the sulfur, and then pumping the liquefied sulfur to the surface. Needless to say, this method was also inaccessible to me. So I'm really hoping that I'll find the sulfate salt, but at this point starting out with nothing, I can't be too picky. My first thought was to try to grow plants that would have a lot of sulfur-containing compounds in them, but after realizing that the plants would have to pull the sulfur from the dirt anyways, my thoughts turned to the purely mineral sources. Now the question was whether I have ores lying around that contain sulfur. Luckily for me, I live in Hamilton, Ontario in Canada, a city with a history of steel production and, as it happens, towns known for their sulfur springs. There are several streets with names referencing sulfur and their springs, so I really knew I couldn't pass this lead up. I contacted one of my friends who used to jog around the forested trails in the city to see if he had any ideas for where I might be able to find sulfur, and he pointed out a specific location right off a road coincidentally called Sulfur Springs Road. Coincidence? I think not. So I headed off to the site. All right, just with my cousin Nathan here, we're gonna try to collect some sulfur. This is the woods that's nearby my house in Hamilton. There's a lot of sulfur springs, so I figured, hey, this is a perfect opportunity to get some sulfur. We'll see if we're lucky today. Got some creek, go creek action going on here. Yeah, but you're supposed to be able to smell the hydrogen sulfide that's formed from the sulfur decomposing in the water, so. If, if we don't smell it, you probably isn't going to be there. True. Mm. So we just exited the woods over there, and to my surprise, we found we found the spring water just being collected by this little stone bucket here, which means that I don't need to collect ore. I could just scrape the sides of this container and get my native sulfur like that. You can see like this yellow deposit over here is just I, I suspect that's just pure elemental sulfur that's collected on the edge here. So this makes my job a lot easier and I, I don't need to lug up a bunch of rocks. Back home, what do you, what do you think, Nate? I'm ready. Oh, sweet. <laughs> okay, let's do this. They even gave us the friggin' chemical composition of everything that's flowing out here. This is insane. This is just so easy. I wasn't... <laughs> I'm just freaking out right now because I was like, man, I, I, after I could do this, I'm going to have to figure out the concentration of sulfur from the stuff that I did. Ah, <laughs> oh, this is amazing. There's all these little cracks in the rock and that allows sand and all the sulfur stuff to just collect in these pools and I could just shovel it up and put it in a bag. Which means I don't even need to crack any rock or anything. We got, the got the this. We got the sulfur. <laughs> it's yellow like gold. <laughs> we got what we came for, as white men, I guess. <laughs> Might as well be worth its weight in gold. That's just pure elemental sulfur sitting in the middle of an urban area. I mean, this is 
I mean, it's forest, but this is just a few minutes away from any major town. So that, you don't see that stuff at just anywhere. So I feel really lucky. Praise God. Yeah, I've, like I said, I've seen people just basically not moving and not getting stuff done because they're so afraid of moving forward. So it's just nice. I got home and proceeded to sort through what I had brought back. Mainly organic matter and some rocks which were covered in the white deposit, which I presumed was sulfur or a sulfur salt. After letting it all dry, I was left with what appeared to be some dark dirt and some light dirt. It actually looked a lot dirtier than I thought it would, and contamination is an issue since I still need to do tests to figure out whether I had elemental sulfur or a sulfur salt. This dirt could contain a lot of other stuff, and without knowing what I was dealing with, the conclusions I draw from my tests wouldn't be very convincing. So I went back a few days later with some more of my family, this time not to collect from the sediment, but from the spring water and the white deposits on the side of the draining bowl, which I thought would be a lot less contaminated. Is this spring always closed? This has been running since as... I think it's it just runs all the time. I collected about 6 liters of the spring water and as much of the mineral deposits on the side of the bowl as I could. As you said, this has been running for so long and all there is is that little bit. <laughs> That's okay. When I got home, I poured out 2 liters of the water into a tray to try to evaporate it so I would be left with any dissolved salts, and I also put the bowl scrapings in a little dish to dry. Now, what I didn't anticipate was that, being in the Great Lakes region of Canada during the arrival of spring, this weather was cold and moist so it took a while to dry. Even now, four weeks later, the stuff in the tray still hadn't evaporated. At least the scrapings dried after a few days, so now I had some material I could begin tests on. When trying to figure out what substance you have, we can employ Leibniz's identity of indiscernibles as a guide. It says, two objects with all properties in common are the same object. This seems about right to me, so my strategy was to try to find out what properties my sample had and whether they were identical to the characteristics of some other thing, and that's what it would be. From my observations, there were two compelling candidates for what I had which were consistent with the observations. Elemental sulfur, or a sulfur salt called calcium sulfate. This is because the sulfury smell from hydrogen sulfide near the spring was consistent with the presence of elemental sulfur or sulfate. As explained in a 2019 review article by Russian researchers Slobodkin and Slobodkina, elemental sulfur, particularly the stable allotrope S8 and sulfate ions, serve as the oxidizers and respiration for sulfur-reducing microorganisms. Much like how we exhale carbon dioxide, these microorganisms exhale hydrogen sulfide as a waste product, meaning if you smell rotten eggs in the air, some little beasties are munching on sulfur or sulfate somewhere. But why did I think it was calcium sulfate? If you recall the chemical composition plaque that was hanging at the spigot earlier, this gave me an idea. Despite the data being over 100 years old and the compositions conspicuously having no units, I'm just going to assume for the time being that it's accurate, at least proportionally. If you look at the plaque, you'll see that the amount of sulfate of lime, or miscellaneous calcium sulfate salts, is more abundant than many other salts, particularly calcium chloride and magnesium chloride. You'll also notice there isn't any magnesium sulfate, despite the magnesium being a relatively abundant metal. One theory I have which is consistent with this evidence is that there might have been aqueous magnesium sulfate in the water, but it reacted with the aqueous calcium chloride, forming solid calcium sulfate as a precipitate. Magnesium sulfate and calcium chloride are both soluble in water, but calcium sulfate is much less so. So it's consistent with this theory that I was able to find a white precipitate on the side of the rock bowl, and that would be calcium sulfate. That's the idea behind my theory anyways. So did I have elemental sulfur or calcium sulfate? Let's pick the properties to test now. So in chemistry and chemical engineering, it's common to group material properties as physical or chemical properties. Physical properties pertain to how the compound reacts just by itself to changes in temperature, pressure, that sort of thing. Properties like boiling point are found here. 
Chemical properties pertain to how it reacts with other compounds, like whether it rusts in air. One physical property I wanted to investigate was my sample solubility, since I found it from a spring. It is well established that the solubility of sulfur is vanishingly small in water, to a magnitude of 10 to the negative 8 molar after 3 months at 25 degrees Celsius, as demonstrated in a 1978 article by French researcher Bruleg. On the other hand, a significant amount of elemental sulfur is soluble in hot ortho, para, and meta xylene, as was recorded in this 2018 report by Dutch researchers Wormink, Spinu, and Versteeg, and as shown in a 2015 video by YouTube creator Doug's Lab. This is in contrast to calcium sulfate, which is soluble in water, albeit slightly. According to a 1973 article by American researchers Carl Berg and Matthews, the anhydrous and hydrated forms of calcium sulfate all have solubilities of over 2 grams per liter of water at the same temperature. The hemihydrate form is particularly soluble at over 5 grams per liter. To complete the square, I wanted to find the solubility of calcium sulfate in xylenes. Surprisingly, I couldn't find any data on this in the literature, so for now I'll just do the test on sulfur. Now, just a reminder, in this series to make aspirin, I can buy whatever I need as long as it's not a reagent in the synthesis, so I can buy all the stuff I need to do this test, including the xylene. Okay, let's start. About one liter of solvable brand xylenes was purchased at the hardware store Canadian Tire for $11.99 in 2021 moose tokens, and 300 grams of Safer's brand gardening sulfur dust was purchased at the same place for $8.99. These products are very common and affordable in Canada. Ortho, para, and metaxylenes are often sold as a mixture for use as a cleaning solvent, and sulfur is used as a pesticide in gardening. Before starting, I consult the safety data sheets for all the materials I'll be using. The whole safety data sheet is important, but I pay particular attention to the hazard section, the boiling point and auto ignition temperature, and the firefighting sections. I want to know whether breathing stuff in will kill me, and how much I can heat the stuff up without it all bursting into flames, and if it does, how I can put out the fire safely. For sulfur and xylene, breathing in an amount you are barely able to smell for a few hours appears to be fine. Also, auto-ignition occurs at 235 and 464 degrees Celsius respectively, and boiling points are 455 and 137 degrees Celsius. I'm going to be heating the xylenes well below 137C, so that's not an issue. To put out a fire, we are instructed to use a non-water fire suppression system, so I obtain a suitable fire extinguisher from that same hardware store. Keep in mind that xylenes are a component of gasoline, and their fire diamonds are very similar, so treat this stuff with the same amount of respect as petrol. Fire diamonds for many common chemicals can be found in the United States government NOAA site called Cameo Chemicals for free. This site, along with the safety data sheets I consulted, are linked in the description below. Now we can begin. We're going to begin by repeating a known result the dissolution and recrystallization of sulfur and xylenes, so we know we have what the manufacturer of the sulfur dust says we have, and so we know we have a standard to compare the other results to. To start, a few drops of oil are placed on a heated stir plate to increase the heat conduction to the heating surface. A beaker is placed on it and filled with 75 milliliters of xylenes and a stir bar. An unstoppered round bottom flask half filled with water is prepared so I can cover the beaker with it. This will prevent a lot of the xylenes from evaporating away and also keeping the beaker from accidentally moving, although note that the spout of the beaker remains uncovered so it won't build up any pressure while I'm heating it. Never heat a closed system. The temperature of the solution is taken and recorded to be 13 degrees Celsius. Then, only once I needed them, slight heating and stirring were turned on. Once heating starts, I add three scoopalafuls of the safer sulfur dust, which, from my measurements, amounts to between one and a half to three grams. I thought the specific amount wasn't really important since I just need to get a saturated solution. Once this was added, the round bottom flask is lowered so it sits on the opening of the beaker. You can see that the solution is now slightly cloudy and brown. Over the course of 30 minutes, the heating is gradually increased to between 65 and 70 degrees Celsius and six more scoopalerfuls of the sulfur dust is added, representing between 3 and 6 grams. 
The total amount of sulfur dust added so far is therefore between 4.5 to 9 grams. At each addition, the solution became more and more dark and cloudy until it was like a really disgusting black coffee. At this point, you can still see some light colored solids still floating around. That's undissolved sulfur dust, which means I have a saturated solution now. The solution was held at these temperatures for 10 more minutes to let as much of the sulfur dust dissolve as possible, and then after this, the heating and stirring were turned off. The lip of the beaker was cold enough to touch so it was removed by hand, cleaned of oil, and then placed on a cork mat to slowly cool. In less than a minute, I observed bright yellow spears of elemental sulfur begin to crystallize out of solution. This time lapse was taken over 6 minutes. The formation of bright yellow crystals is consistent with previous demonstrations of the recrystallization of sulfur, so it seems like we've reproduced the previous results successfully. With these results, I wouldn't mind trusting the manufacturer to say that this garden sulfur dust is elemental sulfur. Now we can use this as a standard to see if the sulfur spring sample behaves in the same way. Now, just looking at these materials, they look extremely similar. A light gray powder with a slight green tinge. I know this is consistent with what I have being elemental sulfur, but I'm really hoping that that's not the case. Again, I really want this to be a sulfate salt. It would be a pain to make sulfuric acid from elemental sulfur. Anyways, the same procedure is carried out with the sulfur spring sample. I had to powderize the sample with a stir rod to get it to be the same consistency as the garden sulfur. I measured the amount I had and it was 2 grams. However, the resolution of the postal balance I used is 1 gram, so the precision is about 50%, but 2 grams is consistent with the 4 scoops I used to add all of the sample. After the 30 minutes of heating, you can see that the solution is a lot paler compared to the garden sulfur run, probably because I didn't add as much stuff. There's also larger pieces of debris floating around. At 40 minutes and 65 to 70 degrees Celsius, I turned the heating and stirring off and the solution was allowed to cool the same way as before. However, I didn't see any of the same crystals form. Both solutions were allowed to completely cool overnight, since it might take a while for the crystallization to complete. You can see that the garden sulfur solution has completely cleared up, revealing large, sparkling, yellow crystals at the bottom. The sulfur spring sample had also cleared up, but it didn't have any large crystals at all. It instead had some shimmering stuff at the bottom. Now, I was tempted to think that this meant that there was no elemental sulfur in the sample, but I also knew I added way less of it than the garden sulfur run compared to the amount of xylene. So it's possible there was elemental sulfur, but I added enough xylene to dissolve it all. I decided to try boiling off some of the xylene just to see if it would recrystallize. As an unrelated aside, an interesting thing I noticed was that bringing both solutions outside into the sun made them cloudy again within a minute, although I don't know why. Putting them back inside made it take 3 hours to clear up again. If you have any ideas why this happened, please let me know in the comments. Anyways, the same experimental setup was used as before, except this time I took away the round bottom flask since I wanted the xylene to evaporate away. Over about 30 minutes, the temperature was slowly brought up to between 85 and 90 degrees Celsius. Although we know from the safety data sheet that xylene spoil at around 137 degrees Celsius, you don't need to heat something to boiling to get significant evaporation. That's why a bowl of water in the middle of a room disappears in a week. The temperature was held in that range for about an hour. My goal was to reduce the volume to about 30 milliliters of xylenes. You can see that as the solution became more saturated in whatever it was being saturated in, it became darker brown just like in the garden sulfur solution. Once it reached 30 milliliters in volume, there was so little material left that it started to heat up quite a bit. When it reached between 100 and 105 degrees Celsius, I turned off stirring and heating and allowed it to cool enough for me to take it off to see if anything will crystallize. After waiting for about 5 minutes, I still couldn't see any crystals. If you remember in the garden sulfur run, the crystallization of the sulfur started within a minute of me taking it off the hot plate. Seeing no crystals here, with this super small amount of xylene, I was kind of relieved. 
To me, this falsified the hypothesis that the sample was mostly sulfur, and that therefore, it was calcium sulfate. But, just when I was thinking that, something incredible happened. Barely perceptible at first, but completely unmistakable once it started. I saw yellow spears begin to emerge from the bottom of the beaker. I was a bit in denial, so it took a while for me to start the time lapse, but there was no mistaking it. The sample I collected from the spring was elemental sulfur. But I was still holding out hope. Maybe, by some mechanism I didn't know about, xylene might be able to pull the sulfur out of calcium sulfate to recrystallize it. This idea seemed to contradict my understanding of equilibrium theory, since the stability of the sulfate ion is one reason that sulfuric acid is so strong. But it still seemed like a possibility to me, and maybe it was because I was really hoping it was calcium sulfate. I was of course still missing any literature information about the subject, so the only thing left to do was to get the data myself. A new experiment was conducted. I used the same brand of xylenes as before, but this time I grabbed some calcium sulfate dihydrate, also known as gypsum, since calcium sulfate would become hydrated if I sat it in a spring. So, 50 grams of food-grade gypsum was purchased for $1.79 from my local brewing supply store. In Hamilton, this was brew time located at the intersection of Upper James and Rymel. I'm not sponsored, these are great people and their store smells amazing, go check them out. The same experimental setup as the other two times was set up. Between 30 and 45 milliliters of xylenes were added to the clean beaker. To this, 2 grams of the calcium sulfate gypsum I mentioned previously was added. Now I can't stress how boring calcium sulfate looks. It's an off-white powder and looks just like a pile of white flour. However, when I added it, the solution turned cloudy and a brownish pink color, which was surprising. I didn't expect to see color. Over the next half hour, I brought it to between 105 degrees Celsius, held it there for 10 minutes, and then removed it to see if anything would crystallize. You can see that the solution turns clear pretty quickly with a lot of pinkish powder sitting at the bottom. It seemed like nothing in the solution changed or dissolved. Examining the thermometer bulb, a white powder was coating it from when I dipped it in and it looked just like the starting material. I observed the beaker for 10 minutes to see if anything would crystallize and nothing did. I let it sit overnight along with the sulfur spring sample and still nothing did. A further lack of change was noticed once I decanted off the xylenes into my used xylenes container. At the bottom was a pinkish brown goo. When I let it dry, I was left with a whitish powder which looked like the same gypsum from when I started off. So it seemed like even if the sulfur spring scrapings were 100% calcium sulfate dihydrate, xylenes would not be able to get elemental sulfur to precipitate out. This also meant that if sulfur was able to crystallize out, it would have to be present in elemental form. The only theory we have left, which is consistent with the evidence, is that the sulfur spring sample is a significant source of elemental sulfur. <sighs> well, while I was relegating myself to a future where I'd have to work with elemental sulfur, I began to clean the crystals so I could do a yield calculation, starting with the garden sulfur. Following the procedure from the Doug's lab video, I got a glazed dish lined with paper towel. I decanted the clear xylene sitting on top of the crystals into a jar I set aside for used xylenes. The wet crystals and the remaining junk in the beaker is then poured onto the coffee filter and allowed to dry in a ventilated area. The same procedure was done to dry the crystals from the sulfur spring sample, except the solution was a lot cloudier with some unknown stuff, and I did it through a coffee filter to catch stray crystals. You can see in this shot just how little the sample from the spring is and how small the crystals are. I put in a Canadian dime for scale. While the crystals were still damp with xylenes, I used a stainless steel craft knife to pick up the crystals and sort them into a pile away from the bits which were more obviously dirt. I did this while the crystals were still wet, so that they'd stick to the knife. After about 40 minutes of sorting, you can see in this shot that I ended up with three relatively dirtier piles and two relatively purer piles with larger sulfur crystals. Now, I didn't have a sensitive enough balance, nor any graduated cylinders, so I came up with this method to find the relative abundance of sulfur to other stuff in the sample. I thought back to the large piles of sulfur in Alberta, and it reminded me about this idea I heard a while ago that piles can only go so high for a given pile diameter. 
Doing some research, I found that the characteristic metric for this was the angle of repose, which is the angle that the face of the pile makes with the ground. I found that this is still a very active area of research in 2021, bringing up some extreme examples with star-shaped granules which can form repose angles of 90 degrees. If you want to learn more about granule piles, there's an excellent open access review written by Biakawi al-Hashemi and Bagraba al-Amudi in 2018. So it seemed like I was right. Piles of randomly packed granules have a maximum height at a given diameter. I therefore thought if I couldn't measure mass or volume, I could at least measure the length of the piles that the samples could make and do a sort of relative comparison that way. So using a ruler, I drew out two equally skinny rectangles across the length of a piece of paper, stuffing the dirtier granules into the top rectangle and the cleaner stuff below. Using skinnier rectangles will exaggerate the length more at the cost of making it harder to cram the stuff in, so choose your width wisely. I chose 5 millimeters. You can see in this shot that, as predicted, both piles were roughly the same height, between 2 to 3 millimeters tall, meaning the only dimension which can change are the pile's length. Of course, there is some tapering off at the end of these piles which can affect their length. Whenever you engineer anything in the real world, you're always going to have to deal with edge effects. Fortunately, if you make the length of the piles much larger than their width, the effect of the tapering can be reduced to become insignificant. For my purposes, with so many other sources of error, it's okay for me to assume it is. Placing a ruler at the start of both piles, we can see that the length of the dirtier pile is 186 millimeters, and the length of the cleaner pile is 157 millimeters. We add these up to get the total length, and then divide the amount of clean material by this amount to get the nominal abundance. Incorporating the measurement errors and rounding to the appropriate number of significant figures gives us a final answer of 0 0.458 plus minus 0 0.003, or in other words, the sample that I scraped off the sulfur spring was 45.8% elemental sulfur with a measurement error of 0.3%, if you measure using my technique. Of course, this calculation was done assuming that the dirtier pile is completely dirt and the clean pile is completely sulfur, or that the volume of impurities in both piles are the same amount. This assumption might not be true, but still, 45.8% is pretty good for a natural source, and 0.3% is a pretty good precision. That's what's so great about the engineering mindset. Even if you're missing tools, you can create the tools you need to solve your problem. Now, as an attempt to quantify how accurate my measurement was, I took the dried crystals from the garden sulfur and did the same procedure as for my sulfur spring sample. You see, on the bottle that the sulfur came in, the manufacturer says that it's 92% sulfur. Looking at what I recovered, I calculate a relative abundance of 78.3% plus minus 0.3%. This is 13.7% lower than the expected value from the manufacturer which is a compelling piece of evidence consistent with the idea that the amount of sulfur in the sulfur spring scrapings could actually be higher than I calculated. You can even see that the dirt in the garden sulfur is powdery, but it's being held together here in solid chunks, which could be due to sulfur. In the future, I might revisit this step and filter off the dirt in both samples before evaporating the xylenes to get more accurate measurements, but for now, I've demonstrated that I can get about half purity elemental sulfur from a natural source, and I'll stick with the more conservative amount of 45.8 plus minus 0.3% for the remainder of this project. As a final thing, I tried weighing the dried samples. The sulfur spring sample was less than 2 grams, so it didn't even register on my postal balance. The garden sulfur sample weighed in at 5 grams, which is consistent with the 4.5 to 9 grams I estimated that I added earlier. So that's it for the analysis for this project. Now to clean up. The crystals of sulfur from the spring and from the garden sulfur were each poured into their own test tubes and stoppered for storage. I let the minuscule amount of xylenes remaining on their beakers evaporate completely into the air outside, rather than washing it down the drain so municipal wastewater treatment wouldn't have to take care of it. The gypsum that I cooked in xylenes and the tissue paper that I used to wipe off dried debris from the glassware were thrown into the garbage. I decided that these were an acceptable method of disposal because, in my research on the environmental impact of releasing xylene into the atmosphere, it turns out that xylene is photo-oxidized in air, nitrogen oxides, and sunlight into simpler ketones and aldehydes, and anaerobically into other products, all of which, in a twist of coincidence, are eaten by sulfate-reducing microorganisms, completing a cycle. 
Life is awesome, isn't it? The majority of the xylenes from the crystallizations were kept in a glass jar and not in polyethylene since xylene dissolves that plastic. It's also kept away from sunlight since I noticed earlier that it got cloudy when I brought it outside and I don't want any unexpected solar initiated reactions occurring inside of it. Since the xylenes were a mixture of ortho, para, and metaxylene, I opted to call it OPM xylenes and affixed an appropriate label using white glue so I could wash it off easily if I needed to. Everything was labeled with the date they were stored and the samples were also labeled with the location I got them from and the last reaction they were used in. <sighs> Alright, so that wraps up this first step of the experiment. Now, even though I did get elemental sulfur and not a sulfate salt, I'm still pretty happy I managed to get any sort of sulfur compound at all, let alone one that it's 50% pure and at the first location that I tried. All right, so let's talk about the cost for this project. Now, I don't know if you have a spring near where you live, but uh, for me, it took an hour to walk to the spring and then to scrape the sulfur. And then I also had to let it dry. Um, let's just say it dries immediately. I still had to walk an hour to get two grams of sulfur. So that's gonna be the cost to get the sulfur here in Southern Ontario. It's just not very efficient to get it near the surface like I did. Well, it doesn't matter too much anyways, because even though the time cost for this material is rather high, if you remember from my first video introducing this project, for the subsequent steps on the synthesis towards aspirin, I'll be able to buy elemental sulfur at a similar purity. Now, this is 92% pure like I like I showed in this video and this is 45.8 so there's quite a difference but I think this is still impure enough for it to be suitable for this project for the ethos of this project and uh, it'll be an interesting challenge to deal with the clay and the dirt in here. I hope I showed in this video that having a broad range of ideas and even rather disparate subjects can help you solve problems you thought were intractable from logic to granule pile physics, I used these ideas to overcome the problems I had without having precision equipment. Now, like I said I would do, if you want to replicate any of the steps you saw me do here in this video, I put them all in a cleaned up text document and an open GitHub repository. The link to that is in the description. In my next video, I'll be tackling more of the starting ingredients on the left side of the process chart. So if you haven't already, consider subscribing and supporting this project on Patreon. I'll see you then. Here's a list of all the search queries and the references I used for the research in this video.